Hey everybody, welcome back to the Woodworking Talk Show. If you haven't already done so, don't forget to sign up for my free monthly woodworking newsletter over at notesfromsteve.com. It's got tips, tricks, who doesn't want tricks, cool projects from the community, and kind of a rambling letter from me that may or not sort of kind of be about woodworking. <laughs> With well over half a billion views, that's with a B, it's hard to even imagine. Matthias Wandel maintains the largest woodworking channel on YouTube. Okay, so so get this, Matthias, I was doing a little counting on your channel. You have posted 126 videos that have over a million views each. Oh, and three more on your second channel, your, your lesser channel. <laughs> That's mind boggling. <laughs> He posted his first video on April 9, 2007, entitled simply Slippery Road Conditions. It's got to be my personal favorite. <laughs> you should remake that video. You ever think about remaking that video? It's classic. Got to wait for the right conditions. <laughs> <laughs> Since then, he has become the foremost expert on making his own woodworking machines, including, okay, bear with me. I'm probably going to leave some out. A homemade jointer, a table saw, three different belt sanders, a homemade lathe, a sawmill, a bunch of bandsaws, including most recently a huge 26-inch bandsaw, a computer-controlled box joint jig, a slot mortising machine, a horizontal boring machine, a homemade air cleaner, and a couple of super impressive panta routers, all with highly detailed plans so you can build them yourself. And... These aren't just demonstrations. He actually uses these as his primary tools in his shop. But that only scratches the surface. He's designed and built countless machines for use outside the shop. Things like a baby rocking machine, a self-driving scaffold. <laughs> I like that one. An apple grinder where everybody had to ask, what is an apple grinder? A pipe organ, a Jenga pistol, a wasp sucking machine, and an air raid siren. Matthias is an engineer who's developed computer programs to answer questions and run experiments in his home and his shop. He does construction and home improvement projects as, as well as making and building fine furniture. His channel feature, features solid woodworking tips and tricks. There's more of those tricks right there. He makes wooden gears, marble machines, tests airflow and fans, and builds incredible mazes to test mice. Those are also pretty hilarious videos. I think I think you get the idea at this point. If I kept going, there'd be no time left for a conversation. Oh, and on top of all of this, he's like really keyed into YouTube. I've always enjoyed our conversations about the inner workings of YouTube, kind of the analytics numbers and what makes for a viral video. And he stays current with what other channels are up to. And, oh, most notably, though, he's also a two-time guest on my Chad and Steve Have a Podcast podcast. We're going to have to have you on again pretty soon. And, oh, finally, it, we're coming up on our 10th anniversary of our Skype for Woodworkers April Fool's <laughs> collaboration video. Wow. It's been oh, that my long. God. Anyways, Matthias, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> that was a nice intro. I think that just about covered at least some of it. And you do a lot of, lot of stuff over there. You know what I forgot to mention? That you never applied for your... Did you ever apply for your gold play button? I was just it. thinking about that recently. Is like, yeah, I guess that it's a relatively unusual thing, but I'm just like, <laughs> well, it, actually, it you might would have, be, you know, maybe a decade from now, it might be a useful memento. But right now, it's like, what would I do with it? You've got three buttons coming to you. You've got a, a silver play, gold play, and a silver play for your Matthias Random Stuff channel. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot, but. You're kind of, I always kind of think of you as the, you're the anti-YouTuber and you're the most successful anti-YouTuber. <clears throat> you sort of, you do everything that they tell you not to do on YouTube. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, I'm sure you watch Veritasium. Oh yeah. Yeah, I see his most recent so, video. So, uh, you know, that inspired me to say, yeah, I should maybe uh, think about my titles a bit more. Yeah. Anyways, I went back and changed a couple of old ones and then I looked at my subscriptions page and uh, it seems everybody watches him because suddenly all the titles of all the new videos I saw were rather clickbaity. <laughs> I'm like, it's, God! <laughs> it's so true. I did the exact same thing. You know what I did is I spent like two hours on Monday or whenever that video came out. 
And in case you haven't seen this video, anybody watching or listening to this, Veritasium had a video on why clickbait works. And exactly, he kind of separates the difference between good clickbait, which is just an enticing title, but the content pays off. It delivers on that. And kind of the bad clickbait, which doesn't deliver. You know, you've got like boobs in the thumbnail and that sort of thing that doesn't isn't even in the video, you know, just to get people to click. So his focus is on the good type of clickbait and how an enticing title can just improve a video enormously. Well, you know, I once I like seeing all those rather clickbaity and they may be good clickbaity, but still all these deliberately made to be intriguing, intriguing titles. You know what? I didn't want to watch any of those videos. <laughs> well, that's why um, you're the So anti. it's like, yeah. I think clickbait, you know, just like a university degree used to give you a big advantage before most of the population got one. Um, I think titles like that, people will grow immune to it. It also sort of reminds me, you know, whenever you read like some news article from, you know, LA Times or whatever, some... At the bottom, you see all this, you know, I think they call them chum boxes or something like that, where you have all these rather very intriguing things in there. And, you know, I used to click on some of those because they were intriguing and I was always disappointed. And since then, I've learned it's like, don't even look at the links at the bottom of the article. Yeah. And he actually, Derek mentioned that in his video. It's like a lot of us say that, well, we're not, a, we're immune to clickbait or we won't do that, but it still works because a lot of people still click that stuff and so what i yes, did well so those articles those clickbaity links at the bottom of those articles used to work on me to some extent and now you know it's just like we've become ad blind it's like you know blinky text used to give you emphasis and now it's like you know well i mean things have changed a bit but you've learned it's like if there's something animated it's not important yeah so i went to i have tube buddy this thing where you could a b test titles thumbnails, descriptions, all that sort of thing. So I just went through like 20 of my videos and did a B testing. I set it up earlier this week for just titles alone. And I'm curious to see what is going to happen. It, it goes until it has a significantly significant. What am I trying to say? Until the results are significant. In other words, it'll just keep going until there's a major difference there. And so I, what I would do and I've noticed that this works, and this will see if this confirms it, is say I've got two titles, uh, five things, five, five tips for using a jigsaw. Or you could title that, Don't Do This Thing With Your Jigsaw. Okay, both, of those th both of those titles are completely different. But the, the information might be the same in each video. In, in the first video, the things you want to do with your, with your jigsaw, there might be information in there of, by the way, don't do this with your jigsaw. But if you emphasize the negative, don't do this, it usually gets way better clicks than here's things to do. I've had, uh, yeah, a, uh, a video I made way back, um, was it three table saw mistakes to avoid or something like that because I had... A friend use and you know he made a couple of mistakes with the table saw that you know, hadn't even occurred to me to make because of you know experience and so I was going to put that in the main video and then it's like no let's put that in a separate video because you know that was a little bit more critical of what he did in the shop whereas I wanted the main video to be more positive and the second video is like three table saws three, three tricks three mistakes to avoid it's like that was gotten way more views in the main video does it kind of blow you away of how many views your videos get you are the biggest woodworker on youtube when it comes to just sheer amounts of views nobody has over that i found has over half a billion that's views. cumulative views though like sure but nobody like, even some of the largest and i think most people think of large channels they think of a subscriber count but i to me the number of people who've actually watched your videos is really kind of the the more important well metric. it's sort of subscriber count like you know the subscriber count is also sort of a cumulative metric and it used to be easier to get subs than it is now yeah um i think people like i don't know somehow the emphasis is less on subscribing than there used to be so people are less likely to hit subscribe so in terms of views i get now like i'm down to you know 1.2 million a month which you know i used to be at 10 million a month for uh quite a while so and then you, you know, like bourbon moth and what's the other guy that some of those guys that have just yeah him and um 
and Blacktail Studio, those two are, are killing it. They're like the two most popular. You, yeah, so, right? you know, it makes you kind of wonder about, you know, you in terms of building up sort of a business on YouTube because it's like, what's it worth? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it used to be having subscribers really meant something because that got you more views, but now it doesn't. And, you know, somebody can come seemingly out of nowhere in that I wasn't even aware of those guys and suddenly they're way ahead. So right. what sense does it make to, you know, you're not really investing in the future. You really have to look at it as like how much, how many views do I get now? How much does it pay now? Not well, what am I building up? It's like, how well does it work now? That's what matters. And the future, you know, that could just disappear like that. I think Derek mentioned that in his video too about subscribers and how YouTube changed that a few years ago where because what would happen is when you emphasize subscribers pe viewers will come in watch their subscription feed they go to the sub, sub box watch those and then they leave and they found if they kind of downplayed the whole subscription model in favor of discovery and watch next thing they could get people to stay on the platform a lot longer yeah and that also like I think I think it used to be like way back. Remember the first uh, the first sort of scandal with uh, PewDiePie. The um, first one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, what he did wasn't really that bad, but you know, it was yeah. sort of the start of cancel culture. Yeah. Um, and it was also kind of part of the apocalypse too. Kind of kicked. Out. Yes. So I think at that point they realized, like, okay, you know, we've got these big YouTubers that are too powerful because if you had a lot of views on your videos, then their videos ranked higher. So basically, you were you got more views because you were big and you became big because you got views, which basically would have resulted in stagnation to some extent because it makes it hard for somebody to come from nowhere. So they put a lot more emphasis on, you know, like how well does the video do versus how many, how much clout do you already have, which I think my suspicion is the main motivation for that at the time was to make people like PewDiePie, PewDiePie less important mm -hmm. um, because you know, it's not good for them to have a few mega stars like that, that can, <laughs> they'd rather have a lot of small stars so that they're the more powerful one as opposed to having a few, a few mega stars that can control things. So one of the phenomenon I've been noticing in the past year, and I don't think there's a name for it yet. We need to coin an expression. I was talking to Chad about this. I was like, is it like subscription bloat or something like that? There's gotta be a word for this where there's these channels that came and got real popular in subscribers fast, like Dad, How Do I, where he was getting like 4 million subscribers. He's still getting 60,000 60, subscribers a month. But his view counts on the individual videos are just low. I mean, super low, like under 20,000 views per video. So, And there's another one. There's like Grandma... Skyrim or something. It's this, it's this 85 year old woman who plays Skyrim and she's got almost like a million subscribers, but nobody really watches the videos. So people are subscribing to channels as a form of like. I like the channel. I like the concept. I liked you, but I'm not really going to watch the videos. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I, to me, it's actually realizing how little subscribers matter because my second channel. Um, the videos lately I've put on that one have gotten as many views as on the main channel, even though it's only got like, was it 110,000 subs on there, uh, versus almost 1.6 million on the main channel. Um, so your subscriber count really doesn't matter very much. And I used to think of the second channel as, you know, that's where I put the stuff that I didn't consider worthy of the main channel, but I can't really say that that's the smaller channel now in terms of how videos are doing in the view counts on it. Um, so I think going forward, um, I'll just say if it's woodworking related, it goes on the main channel. And if it's anything else, it goes on the second channel, because again, the, the second channel isn't necessarily the smaller channel at this point, even though it's got way fewer cumulative views and, uh, way fewer subscribers in terms of how new videos do on that one, it's doing as good as the main channel really. Yeah. I, Cause that's when I was in that intro and I said, you had three videos on your second channel with a million views. I, I, was I think it's just two. I was fudging a little bit because your your one has 915,000, but that's yeah, going to be a million really soon because you posted that video one month ago. Yeah, was... it slowed down a bit. It's down to like 5,000 a day. So I'm hoping there's enough summer left because that's kind of a yeah. summer 
I'm hoping there's enough summer left to get up to a million. <laughs> so that was fascinating. It was the best fan placement to move air through your house. And so what you did was you set up a, a, a box fan. I like that, a couple different fans, didn't you? Or, yeah, yeah. And uh, in different positions, how far to place it against from the window, an open window, which direction should it face, all these things you tested to see where's the the optimum spot for it. And I thought it was just fascinating and apparently a lot of other people did too. It's it's a very relatable one because it's, it's a problem that a lot of people think about. I was even approached by one TV program about interviewing for that, but then they, they never followed through on that. So it, it sort of has that sort of mainstream appeal to it. Yeah, because it's something we could all easily do. It doesn't cost us any extra money. You know, if you, if you, you don't have to go out and buy anything, I've already got the fan now, how can I even improve a fan. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what I want to talk about real quick, because I don't think I've ever asked you this before, is how did, were you woodworking as a child? What was your childhood like? Because I know that you, your dad was a woodworker and was the rest of your family, were you exposed to all of that early on and did you just take it? Yeah, I was, my dad, uh, you know, it was the 70s. Uh, things were not as dangerous as they are today. So my <laughs> dad, uh, I know when we're still in Germany, so I, this would have been when I was 10 or possibly younger, he'd let me use the workshop on his own. He, he wouldn't let me use the table saw, but the bandsaw and the drill press I could use without him being there. Um, and I did, you know, tinker around and stuff like that and build stuff and then moved to Canada. He built up a wood shop again there. And again, I was able to do stuff, which I took woodworking in high school just because it, um, it was a quote arts elective so even though i didn't learn anything there it's like i took it because it's like there wasn't very many arts electives that were appealing to me um and that was frustrating in high school because they wouldn't let you really just do stuff you already knew everything <laughs> probably <Yeah. laughs> that they, they would have taught you anyhow at what point did you decide that you wanted to make engineering your profession uh that was, I never did very well in school up until the last couple of years of high school when suddenly in terms of the courses that I, you know, I could select the courses and so focus more on courses that I liked and had good teachers, uh, which made, you know, the science-y sort of stuff was, you know, to me, that sort of stuff is fun. At which point I got good enough grades that I could even consider going to university, which then I did. And, uh, you know, I've always enjoyed sort of tinkering and that sort of thing. What was the degree? What degree, degree did you get? Was that electrical engineering, mechanical engineering? Um, it's there's a program called systems design engineering. I, I started out mechanical engineering. Was a bit disappointed with the attitude of the people in the class. Really? But there's another department called systems design engineering, which is kind of, you know, some mechanical, some electrical, some computer. Um, in retrospect, I like to think of it as bullshit engineering. Yeah. because they're kind of full of themselves. But I knew a bunch of cool people that were in that in that uh, department. So uh, I switched to that, which I'd like to say that was my second mistake, but I wasn't going to switch again. So I <laughs> finished that. What, what didn't you like about the people in those, in those classes, in those programs? Well, the first one is sort of a quintessential comment that made it sort of, I was living in residence and, you know, I was doing some pencil drawings and stuff like that. I enjoyed that. And I actually uh, did it one that I was very happy with of uh, our cats from back home, just from a photograph. And the guy on my floor, he just looked at it and said, like, I'd like to keep my tool rigid. Which, you know, I was like, what does he mean by that? And the more <laughs> I thought about it, it's like the sadder that comment was. <laughs> but that was kind of, you know, a bit more the attitude um, the class name they chose, elected, was Orgasmic. <laughs> I was just like, oh. oh. We, we've got a pizza chain out here. I don't know if, if they're just in California or not. It's just called Pizza Orgasmic. Uh, and I thought, I'll bet that was funny for five minutes. And now they have to live with that name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So you got a job working for RIM. I know you, you worked on probably... Do you work on BlackBerry? Is that what you? Yeah, yeah. Well, it wasn't called BlackBerry. Yeah, the company changed its name to BlackBerry after I left. Oh, okay. So you were just, and, but you were working on PDAs. Yeah. Well, we never did the PDA itself. But like, it was focus has always been more on the wireless. 
Oh, okay. That wasn't what the company was about initially, but by the time I joined in 93, um, the focus, you know, the main focus of the company was rapidly switching to wireless. Yeah. So I'd like to say I was the last person hired there that wasn't specifically for wireless because the first project I worked on was actually something not at all wireless. Huh. It was for the motion picture industry. Really? Yeah. What was it? What it's, uh, it's, they call it the DigiSync. It was a film barcode reader. So, what they started doing is as things switched over to more electronic, um, they would shoot the film on negative stock, then scan it all into the computer and edit it. And then from that, go back and cut the film stock accordingly. Um, so, they'd edit at really low res, you know, like VHS kind of quality. Because, you know, getting those cuts just right, as, you know, we YouTubers know, that. You know, it's like, oh no, that's not quite right. Like, let's yeah. let's move it by five frames. Okay, that looks better. <laughs> um, can you imagine doing that as you're splicing the <laughs> film stock? <laughs> I used to actually splice film. I shot Super 8 film. I don't know if you oh. shot that back in the 80s and or early 80s, but right before video was coming out, and then I would get the video cameras. I could I could check them out from the school library, and then everything switched to video. But yeah, I remember. Yeah. Splicing so, film. Ugh. So you know, on uh, thirty-five millimeter film, along the edge, you have like the, you know, the the picture number. Mm -hmm. So for motion picture film, they started putting just a little barcode, which essentially was like a footage count. You know, this roll this far in. Um, so then, they, as they scan it in, the DigiSync would read the barcodes and read that into computer files at the same time. Then it edited the film, and then the editing program would spit out a cut list that says, "Okay, we need to." this piece of this roll from this point to this point um and cut it like that so and it could so physically cut automated it, the physical cutting of the film was automated no oh no. it wasn't so, it would just so, tell you where, huh. because then they'd cut the original film stock which is precious 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 stuff and you know considering the budgets so then you probably get somebody like with white cotton gloves going through the original film <laughs> stock and you'd run it through this barcode reader and it'll tell you exactly it's like this is the point Oh. You know, cut here, uh, or it'll tell you this is frame footage number, and you know, so you look at the cut list, and without having to like look at the little numbers on the edge of it, it would tell you, yeah, this is the spot. You know, so they'd know where to cut it and splice the film together. So they then edit the original negatives, and then from then go on to make the positives for the theaters and whatnot. Wow. That's that product, of course, is completely obsolete now. That's, I was going to say, that had to be a short-lived process. Wow. It uh, it had been around from before I started, and you yeah. know, things didn't really go fully digital for yeah. another five, ten years after that. There were always those transitional products yeah, in yeah. between things. Did you ever, did you ever watch the channel Company Man? I don't know if you've ever even heard of that. No. It's a guy who just talks about big companies and like the rise and fall of companies and what caused the problem. One of them was on... BlackBerry, the rise and fall of BlackBerry, and what happened. And I didn't realize they were still making those up until just a few years ago. That they were making yeah, those. Yeah, the companies actually like it's they like kind of couldn't a... adapt to phones. They were real late on it, uh, getting to smartphones. They were still dedicated to those little PDAs. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was part of a <clears throat> part of the attitude was um, at some point by Mike Lazaridis. It's like you know now we just have to execute and not screw up. <laughs> as opposed to this no it's a continued race you, you know you, you keep you know the, the paranoid survive is sort of something you hear sometimes um so it's like okay we got this great product that's you know let's let's ship you know like let's transition into a more stodgy old kind of company um but that you know that worked until apple and google got, got into the market right. um we were you know we were pretty safe against the uh, telecoms at the time because they were stodgy old telecoms and they couldn't move very fast uh, but Apple and Google had both the scale to build a mobile device because you got to, you know, it takes billions and they, they moved faster. So that's, that kind of was the beginning of the end for, uh, when, once those guys got in there. All right. Were you still doing woodworking while you were working at RIM? Oh yeah. Yeah. I built, I even built a few, uh, jigs and stuff that I used at work. <laughs> really? Oh. Yeah. And did, at what point did you quit? rim knowing that you wanted to pursue woodworking or was that at the time when you started youtube um i i started youtube because it's like what am i going to do after rim i had another job kind of lined up uh before i even gave notice but then as the time came closer the company that i was wanting to join they're like well things are a bit slow right now so if you could maybe 
wait a couple of months. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Um, and, you know, just exploring other options. So um, YouTube had just been bought by Google. So it's like, oh, let's play around with that. And the other thing I was playing around with was AdSense. That was kind of hot at the time. Um, in fact, if you <laughs> Google quit rich quick, <laughs> AdSense was one of the things that would come up. <laughs> <laughs> and some people, some people did do really well. Uh, I I peaked out at about a hundred dollars a day on AdSense. Uh, this is before YouTube was making much money. Like AdSense at this point for me, it's it's not really returning very much. I recently spent some time tweaking that. Are you talking about the YouTube AdSense or the AdSense on your website? AdSense for websites. Yeah, yeah, like the YouTube ads that didn't come in until a few yeah, years yeah. after that. Yeah. And do you still run ads on your website? Yeah, and I was just uh, I was actually doing some work recently to make the website more mobile friendly because you know with these these damn phones which (laughs) (laughs) you know the narrow screens so to make it uh make the layout a little bit more responsive to that right um and then it's like okay and then you know let's rejigger the ads but what's been discouraging is uh i look at the ads and it's at least for the stuff the ads that i see it's the ted's woodwork ted's woodworking scam god in various forms and other scams like i was just looking at john heist's website and there's an ad that was for plug this thing into your wall and it cuts your electricity bill by 90 percent. you know like Mm -hmm. clearly a scam um so i guess the scams are just simply the most profitable because they don't have to deliver anything anything real um so they can bid higher and so that's been kind of discouraging it's like okay do i really want to peddle ted's woodworking (laughs) Or it's that sort of scam is like, oh. Well, yeah. I've noticed a, a huge surge in Ted's woodworking in the last few months. And um, it, I mean, it, it's hard to do anything about it because that's the number one selling product on ClickBank. ClickBank is the is the service that runs that whole, you know, what do they call it? They call it like affiliate sales, basically, is what they call mm-hmm. it. But it's a, it's a thing where it's kind of a pyramid scheme. But I've been noticing for a, like a month ago, my luckily I've got all those block words, you know, I'm sure you do too on YouTube. And it was like wood glut and um, what's the other one? There was a couple of these things that all lead to Ted's woodworking. All spam leads to Ted's woodworking. <laughs> yeah. And I was just getting like hundreds of those on my channel a day. I mean, it was just like flooding through there. And so then I, uh, I, I thought, well, I'm going to get this Ted's Woodworking newsletter. Because as soon as I started doing a newsletter, it's really weird because they're like monitoring everything that I'm doing and trying to copy it. And so they, they literally copied one of my sales video. I mean, literally word for word and put it on their website then what, with now, a different person reading it oh it's a totally different guy but he's like used language i actually made a side-by-side video comparing it and i was like you're not going to believe it. i'll have to send that to you so you can take a look at it but the uh so then they start sending out this newsletter and now they're calling the guy steve and so the letter comes, and they're, they're, what they're trying to do is create brand confusion. Wasn't it always the, Steve McGrath or something? That, that, that it was Ted call? McGrath. This oh. is the, 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 the quote Ted, which is oh, a... Oh, so he's now a, this guy will be Steve's woodworking. Which is just, it just sucks. <laughs> and so the, these, the newsletters come out and they say, Steve wants you to have this. And Steve is talking about this. And Steve apparently is the guy, that the actor in this video. So we're trying to figure out what to do about it. There's not much you can do about it because ClickBank is huge. And this has been their best selling product for like 15 years. And it's just, it's just a total, it's so frustrating. I remember they took down, I had a video on my channel like 10 years ago talking about Ted's woodworking. And I investigated it. I found out that Ted is just a stock photo. It's called Happy Man Stock Photo, you know, and it, the okay. address doesn't exist. None of this stuff is real. And they sent me like a cease and desist thing on my website. And then they're like, we're going to take down your whole website and everything. I just, I just took it down because I'm like, I don't have time to deal with this. I figure at this point, you know, let the buyer beware, whatever. If you want to buy into this stuff. Oh, so that's ahead. why, well, but you've, you've like reorganized your whole website. I thought just with the reorganization, you didn't bother keeping that. No, I, I took it down because that that was a long time ago. I took that thing down after I got that note from them. It was one guy approached me about, uh, or emailed me about uh, what I thought about that because he's setting up a website for affiliate, you know, to 
Pebble affiliate links essentially, and uh, you know he's got several of promising ones with ClickBank, especially the Ted's Woodworking. What do I think of it? And it's like, well, it's a scam, yeah. but uh, just be aware that basically anything on ClickBank is probably a scam. So be aware, like you're peddling scams. Simple as that. <laughs> right, and you're not going to make much money because there's thousands of people who are trying to sell this exact same stuff, and they don't know what it is, and they're all just they forward the same spam i even get them they'll email me saying hey i've got this product we would love to put it in the description of your videos i'm like clearly you haven't seen my video oh sometimes <laughs> when i get approached like that it's like you know it sort of smells of that and i'm like oh and by the way i don't do Ted's woodworking scam yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well you even i think you even took down your contact information from your youtube channel too didn't you that's right. Yeah, I get approached so much. I should possibly, I still get approached a lot. So maybe it's kind of the second channel. Like I get approached by multiple things a day. Yeah. I'm wondering, maybe I should just, it's like, okay, if they send me their product and I don't do what they asked for, it's like, what's their recourse? What are they going to do? Just right. get a bunch of these products and make <laughs> a sarcastic video about them. That's not a bad idea. They, I don't know where they come from, but I can always tell the ones, especially right off the bat when they start with, hello, dear. I don't know why they start that way. Do you get those? Hello, well, dear. that's because they have this address list and they just sent it to everybody. It's not they sent it to you. But why dear? <laughs> Hello, dear. That's the well, strangest opening. I think it's because it's Mr. Translated. could be offensive because, you know, what if your pronoun is something else? <laughs> yeah, I guess that, that's, that's the case. Oh. When did you start making your own tools? What was the first power tool, wood shop tool that you made? Um. Well... I started with jigs, so I built a tenon jig, um, my first tenon jig. I just didn't want to buy the Delta tenon jig. I built that, gosh, maybe 2001. It was long before oh, no, that YouTube. Might be, no, that might be going way, way back. Uh, I'd have to look on my website. Like, this is this is way before YouTube. Yeah. And then I experimented. My first box joint jig, the computer-controlled one, that was 2003. Uh, which was superseded by the geared one because I actually prefer things that don't need a computer. Um, so, and then, so then when I started, uh, when I moved in 2007, after that I built, no, I built a slot mortar ship before that. You know, I built my slot mortar, the first one in 1998. Um, I think the tenon jig would have been around by then already too, because like, those kind of go together. Um, the box joint jig, the very first one was in 2003. Then in 2008, I built the uh, router based slot mortar, so the one that doesn't require this fancy XY table that I had. And then the, uh, and in terms of machines, yeah, I guess the slot mortar so you could count as a machine. Then the first bandsaw was 2010. And the uh, then the pantry rotor was also 2010. And 2011 was the jointer. And another bandsaw. So around that, that was kind of peak in terms of creativity, uh, in terms of like creating new things. Because I, I wasn't making videos so much at the time, which really sped up making things. And plus, I had you know I was single, so I had a lot more time than now. What do you consider the your Panther router kind of your crowning achievement as far as woodworking machines go? That and the bandsaws. All of the bandsaws, yeah. And it, yeah. each bandsaw just gets better and better, doesn't it? Yeah, it's uh, when I built the first one, it was really like, is this going to work? <laughs> um, you know, and every bandsaw since then is like, well, I know it's going to work. Um, and like the 26 inch one that I built, I kind of is, you know, like the last two I built were just kind of refinements on it. I guess the 26 inch one I changed, I built the frame out of like two by material, like two by six, two by eight kind of. Um, which is something that I hadn't done before just because at that scale, the boards w wasn't optimal. And a couple of tweaks to it, to the building, but it's like, as far as I'm concerned, it's like, it's as good as I can make it. Like, yeah. you know, like I can't think of better ways of doing the things that I've done on it. Uh, it's just minor improvements. Is it better than a store-bought version? Is there anything that a store-bought bandsaw would have that yours doesn't? Well, some of the bigger ones, like to have a crank to move the blade guide up and down, that would be a nice thing to have, which mm. I can't really do with wood very well. Um, a steel table is nice because it doesn't, you know, it, it, it can take a lot more abuse. Um, have, you a thought about, motor, have you thought I'd, about incorporating a steel table? Uh, I've thought about putting a piece of steel on top, but it wasn't, it hasn't been important enough. Yeah. 
Um, and then, of course, bigger motors. Because, um, like, yeah, you know, like this, you know, this three quarter horsepower motor is powerful enough for what I do, and I already have it, so I use that. That sort of thing. Are there any tools you just wouldn't make that just they're just not worth the trouble? A drill press. A drill press, yeah. Yeah, that's that's. I thought about it from time to time. Maybe I will still, but it's like this mechanism of the quill that travels up and down oh. while it spins is that's some machine parts. Table saw is also another one that to do it well requires some machine parts. Well, you did Although, make a table saw. Yeah, based on a circular saw. John Heist has built a, a mm -hmm. really good homemade table saw, but like he used the arbor from an actual table saw because uh, that's one of the key machine parts that you need. Um, he has a depth and tilt adjustment mechanism, but that's really hard to get right out of wood. So, um, I don't use a homemade table saw and I don't use a homemade drill press. Right. What's your, what's your best selling one on or plans as far as people wanting to make their own? The band saws and the panter rotor. Oh, you think that, oh, the panter rotor too. That seems like that's, uh, that one looks so complicated to make to me. Wow. That's amazing. Well, the thing is, if you want something like a panther rotor, like the options are to buy my plans and build it, or redesign it yourself, or buy one for over a thousand dollars. Do you think that people should make their own tools, or if they're if they're in woodworking, that it, it's just worth a shot to just try it, or is it just a special kind of mentality that you need? It, to it do depends that? on uh, if you want to, you should. If you don't, you shouldn't. <laughs> uh, I, I get this emails from time to time. It's like, how long does it take and how much does it cost to build a bandsaw? Sure. And you know, what I read out of that is like, oh, bandsaws are so expensive, but I want one. Building one is an obstacle that I must overcome. <laughs> and you know, if, or, or, you know, how big an obstacle is this to overcome one to get a cheaper bandsaw? So these are people that don't really want to build one, which is to say they're not into that sort of thing, which is mm -hmm. to say they probably wouldn't be very successful at it. They're going to have a bad day. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, you know, they, they just don't think of that way. It's like, well, I could, I could do this this way. It's like, yeah, he's done it this way. I bet you I could do this part better. Or it's like, oh, this is cool. I want to try this, you know, or as opposed to like, okay, let's assemble the kit kind of thing, even though it's not a kit. It's just like, let's yeah. just slog through it because i want this thing not because i want to build it right like putting together an ikea furniture or something yeah yeah exactly yeah i think that's true with kind of probably a lot of woodworking too like even cutting hand cutting dovetails or something like oh all right i guess i'll learn how to do it and then well you don't really have to if you don't want to you know if that's something you enjoy go for it yeah yeah and you know the dovetails uh like if you just put a bunch of screws in the corner, as long as they're not pocket hole screws, that'll be just as strong, really. Yeah. Like if you yeah. put a bunch of long screws into the end grain side by side, actually John Heist did a sort of a funny video with like steel dovetails, you know, it had this silhouette view of like a bunch of screws next to each other. Because it's like, yeah, you know, if you put a bunch of screws next to each other, you pre-drill them so you don't split the wood and they're like, you know, three inches long. It's like, those will hold really good and they'll probably be stronger than the dovetail. Yeah, they do. Even on, you know, knockdown furniture, you can buy a lot of times they're assembled that way with just long screws. They're pre-drilled. So all you got to do is put them into the end grain. And that's just like pressed wood. And I think the idea there is that, well, for the amount of stress it's going to be under, it's OK. It's good enough. You know, if you if you make a desk, you're not going to be subjecting it to a lot of forces, really. It just kind of sits there. So I think yeah, that's... it's just yeah, it's just how many moves does that sort of furniture survive? That's the limit. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, and that's why I think a lot of times that, unfortunately, we've kind of have this mindset of disposable furniture that yeah, we yeah. buy from places like IKEA, and it's fine for an apartment for a while, and then you move on, and it's starting to show signs of wear, and you set it out on the curb, hoping somebody will take it with your free sign on it, and they never do, and then <laughs> it ends up in a <laughs> landfill. <laughs> so I think your most popular videos, though, are your mouse challenges. Yes, your yeah, those maze. are... Wow. Completely separate from the woodworking stuff. There's very little cross pollination between the mouse videos and the woodworking videos. Yeah, it, you probably have a lot of audience who just want to see the mouse videos. They're really funny. They're really well made, and I love that you add little sound effects and, oh, yeah. and so much work. Too. Yeah, 
It is how how small a hole can a mouse get through? And oh my God, you you kill it on that thumbnail because it, it shows this mouse like squeezing through this tiny hole, and you're just like, I'm rooting for you, mouse, get in there. Yeah, yeah, and then like just having the uh, the shrew, which you know looks like a small mole, showing up, uh, you know, that made for a bit of a plot twist. <laughs> That's but right. Yeah, I, when I shot that, you know, I had the footage from it, and I'm like, yeah, this is okay. And then, okay, as I'm starting to add the sound effects, and you know, the best idea I had was the balloon, the rubbing the balloon for the squeezing through. <laughs> and once I started putting the sounds in, I was like, this is so funny. <laughs> you probably had no idea that the wasp sucking machine was going to be your fourth most popular video. I actually, well, the, the, there's, that was wasp, the wasp sucking machine XL, I think is the... XL, right. <laughs> yes. So the wasp sucking machine one was in 2011, and that actually did quite well. Um, so when I had this wasp problem, so this is on this rural property that we later moved to, and I was out there, and I went in the shed to get something, and I got stung. I was like, <laughs> and I didn't even have my good camera with me um, because I wasn't, I wasn't planning on filming anything. So I had my older camera that I used to film with me that I just used as a still camera with me. And I was like, what do I do now? And it's like, I have to, you know, I am in the moment. I have to film this now. <laughs> you know, so I built this thing and used my old camera to film it. <laughs> Most of it, like then when I came back after the, you know, after I left the wasps in the, uh, in the box for, for a week, that, that was filmed with my good camera. Um, but most of it, yeah, was shot with my, just a little point and shoot camera. It wasn't even a very good one. I think it's also, it's just satisfying to hear those wasps go, joop, 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 get sucked up into that. Yeah, thing. yeah, bouncing through the hose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's so weird. Did you get anybody complaining that it was like inhumane or anything? Oh yeah, of course. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, that goes uh, same with the most videos. How cruel, blah 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 blah. And I'm like, you know, I set a challenge for the mice. It's like, the mice come through your house mm -hmm. if they can, and they'll squeeze through whatever it takes to get the food. And it's like, you know, that's no different from you know, I, I set a challenge. The mouse, the mouse may or may not choose to try to get at the food, but it's no different from the mouse trying to make its way into your house. Yeah. Fortunately, uh, like, there's no mice in in this house. Yeah, well, that's good. The perimeter seems to be most proof. Mention, you mentioned this earlier about your second channel, and I, I wanted to ask you a little bit deeper into that is why not post these over on your main channel? Or was it just you were thinking, because you have, um, like the, the mouse maze videos and things that I, I kind of have the feeling today you would put those on your second channel, but look how good they did on your first channel. And then I look at your second channel which you've got like uh the fan where to place the fan i mean you you've got almost a million views on that i think if you had placed that on your main channel you probably would have had two or three times that i'm not sure i'm not mm. sure at all uh you know john heists you know is to the point where he thinks that a smaller channel will do better mm -hmm. i don't fully agree with him but i don't think the bigger channel will do significantly better right and it, it comes so, back to that. Um, how do you describe a big channel or not? If you're yeah, so so my my you know my 1.6 million subscriber channel, um, I'm not sure the fan video could have possibly done worse on that one. So this is where going forward, I'll just separate things not by greater or lesser video, but by theme. Is it woodworking or is it not woodworking? And you know that 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 fan video, I. I actually, like, I built the uh, apparatus for, because uh, I had to hack the anemometer to get the good enough readings out of it. So I made that video. That's the preceding one. And I sort of said, I'm not sure if the, the video that I'm actually going to shoot is going to be as interesting as this one. Uh, <laughs> you know, I didn't, <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to do as well. You, you, The way you shoot your videos, though, you must get good retention rates on them because you just, you start in with the video and then you just end it. <clears throat> you don't waste a lot of time. I usually, yeah, for the initial, like the initial surge, I get about usually around 66% recension, That's like where it sort of levels off. And then of course, towards the end, you know, when you do the outro or show the thumbnails at the end, that sort of thing, then it really, then it just sort of falls, of course, falls off a cliff. But uh, 
videos that uh older videos that keep getting views those have much lower retention rates you know for instance my uh my 26 inch bandsaw build series that i compiled into one video i think the you know it, it levels out around 15 percent or so so maybe mm -hmm. that's more typical are you thinking about using any of the new youtube features you, you wouldn't do shorts would you you don't seem like a shorts kind of guy uh, i i'd rather it didn't exist <laughs> <laughs> but I feel kind of obliged I should try that and I've been meaning to I just haven't had time to yeah um and you know this is to me it's an unnatural that they do should do so well because um it's because YouTube is trying to muscle into TikTok space TikTok space and so is Instagram kind of thing it's like the more distraction on mobile devices seems to be the trend of the future and they want to be part of this too so is this going to sure. go the way of Google plus and that they invest lots into it and then eventually give up or you know? it, I don't know. It could, it could be. It could be real successful. They started the uh, YouTube Shorts Fund, $100 million fund they're paying out to creators now. But it's not associated with AdSense. And it's just like kind of whether or not they want to pay you to make them or not. So I've been doing a lot of shorts and I got my first Shorts Fund payment out. $240. I'm going oh, to okay. Disneyland. <laughs> So like that's out of a hundred like million one dollars. Ticket for one person or something? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> exactly. I don't know. But I enjoy making them. Actually, we had a guest on our podcast, JJ McCullough, and he was talking about he he really likes using the shorts because he just sees it as a new challenge. And I think to me, I do too. It's like this show to me is a new challenge because a short just to be able to summarize something in under to 150 words really to get it under 60 seconds is interesting and he he said yeah you know if youtube came up with youtube black and white where that was your your you were constrained to only using black and white i would still try it and see if there was some way i could make that work because i love embracing the challenge and i kind of thought about that and i thought yeah i think that yeah. i think a lot of people are hung up on thinking that it is TikTok, but I think what happens is that TikTok has a different culture than YouTube, whereas YouTube is more suited towards um, here's how you do something. Here, here's an interesting thing you can do. People have it in their mind that TikTok is all you know just dance videos and the, these kind of things. But I think that there is room f for it on YouTube if it's done right. Yeah. So some videos, like my paintbrush cleaning video. Uh, with where I clean the paintbrush with the bandsaw. Oh, right. <laughs> I would shoot that as a short now. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Short certainly wasn't something that was in my mind even when I shot that. And that video, you know, got, it's, I don't know, 30,000 views and then kind of stalled out. And then suddenly it got like, or over the course of a couple of weeks, it got another 300,000 views or something like that. Yeah. And now it's, now it's back down to nothing. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I can never really figure out YouTube. I know on those shorts, it takes about a week before all of a sudden they take off. They just flatline. They do nothing for a week. And then all of a sudden YouTube starts to promote them. And I guess that's where their mindset is right now. They just want to promote those. Uh, to me, it, it just seems like, I don't know, it's kind of part of my job to explore all the new stuff, whatever they have, and just see if it works because otherwise it just kind of I feel like I get stuck. I've, I've been meaning to, to try the shorts thing. It's just, there's too many other things to do. And yeah. you know, I have half the time available that I used to have. So I asked you this on the, I would, I'm doing this other project, my documentary, if I ever get, that's a lot of work, but I asked you this then, and I'll ask you again, what do you think that, uh, do you think kind of project based videos, woodworking videos are kind of done you know not done but yeah, it, it's harder yeah. and it's harder it's like and it seems it hurts so many people and on your show too it's like it's just yeah you're competing against so much stuff that's already out there there's so many people doing it they're relatively straightforward to shoot uh yeah. like if i'm doing a project i know exactly what i need to you know what the plot follows the project and if you're working on a project it's also easier to be not nervous about what you know it, it's just logical you you've worked through the project whereas if i do some even like the fan placement video, it's a bit more challenging in the, to think about in terms of you really have to plan it through. Okay, I'm going to, you know, what order should I do the different things in this video uh, to make it work? And there's actually, 
like that one is a bit out of order in terms of what I have in it. And uh, I had to actually like voiceover and there's a few bets extra that are shot in it in the end to make it consistent, which is not something I never have to do with a project video because the project video, again, you just follow the progress. Um, whereas if I'm exploring something or explaining something, it's it's much more challenging to try to make that follow a plot because there is no natural plot. What do you think makes for a good project video that actually people watch? <laughs> well, I think like the personality thing, like that. I watched a few of Bourbon Moth's uh, videos after I saw it, that. It's like they're not they're not interesting to me in terms of learning anything. And but you know, he's kind of got a good narrative. I try this and da da da. He talks a fair bit, way more than I thought would be good for a video. But it's you know, it's working for him. So it's personality driven. Uh, I don't know if you've, uh, you know, in terms of personality driven, do you know about Electro Boom, that channel? Mm -mm. So it's so this guy, um, he used to be like a technician at some company, I think doing static testing and stuff like that. And one of his top videos is like how not to build an electric guitar because he builds his crude guitar and he hooks up the strings directly to a power cord and strums it. <laughs> 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 and it's like it's the stuff is so personality driven and his videos do really well um and he does do some electronic related projects too but again it's very personality driven but then if you know if your project is personality driven is it really about the project anymore yeah i mean that's i think that's what people are starting to discover especially as there's more and more people doing woodworking videos that you know, there's only so many ways you can build kind of the same project. You got to bring more into it. So I think that the key is you got to have something really big or unusual, you know, that people haven't seen before. And, you know, maybe the huge slab epoxy yeah. table or something like that, that people who aren't interested in woodworking can watch. Or and not everybody you, can. Yeah. It's like you like to watch like, you know, these mega construction things and yeah. whatnot. And the other thing, of course, is it's like if you realize, like, oh, these mega epoxy slab countertops are big. Mm. It's like you're not going to build one of those because it's going to cost you thousands of dollars to right. do that. Yeah. Which means there's fewer video. You know, there's also less competition that way. For that, oh, that's true. Yeah, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, you got a lot less competition <laughs> when you're doing something that's expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that. What do you think is the biggest change you've seen over woodworking videos over the past 12, 15 years that we've been on the platform? Well, the quality has gotten way better. Um, how to is much less thing. You know, it used to be Norb Abrams was sort of the standard of reference. Yeah. Have you watched a Norb Abrams show not, recently? Not in years. No. Unwatchable. It is, yeah, I'll bet. Like compared to the stuff out there now, you know, that used to be better than YouTube, but now it's just like, it 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 just goes too slow and mm -hmm. you know and now i'm gonna cut the dados here and he cuts the dados and i'm like that could be tightened up way like tightened up. dissolve transitions and things like that that slow it down even more <laughs> yeah and so and even like certainly i've my father-in-law you see some of my videos he's like this is going way too fast if i wanted to build that it's like well most people don't want to build it and if you do want to build it just watch it twice yeah, well, three times, you yeah. know, uh, because you don't have to get into that much detail. Most people already have a bit of a sense. So if you don't show the start of the cut, it's like people can fill that in. Right. Or if you don't show some of the cut, it's like, yeah, I cut these pieces square. It's like, you didn't need to see that. Yeah, you can probably watch a Norm Abram video now and you're probably watching it with that critical editor's eye thinking, oh boy, I would trim a few frames off of that. <laughs> <laughs> Stop that socket there. So, so yeah, like the quality of just quality has gone way up. Yeah. And then I think partially just, well, first of all, it was a novel thing to watch how to do this sort of thing. But I think everybody's had their fill of, it's like, yeah, I, you know, your armchair woodworker's like, yeah, I think I know how that would go. Even though you've never done it, you don't need to see somebody doing it again. So I think the audience has shrunk in that you know, the novelty is gone. Like, you know, remember Facebook, the early days of Facebook, you'd friend all your, find all your high school friends and friend them. <laughs> yeah. And then there was the Facebook apps and that novelty has gone. Like they've had to move on to other things. Um, so the novelty of how to videos, I think is gone. And then plus the sheer number of good how to videos these days just makes it very difficult to make a dent on it. Although I said that I was emailing John Heist and he's like, no, no, it's not true. They still do well. 
And some of his how-to videos, which are extremely well produced, still do well. Um, but I, you know, I'm looking at some of these, it's like, yeah, you built this toolbox kind of thing, but it's like the amount of time that you had to put into this is like, I'm sorry, I just, I right. don't have that kind of time anymore. Well, that's the frustrating thing is to put in a lot of time on a project video, because then you're adding into not just making the video, but you have to actually make the project, which is just tons of labor. And then when people just aren't really that interested in watching it, it doesn't, it doesn't make financial sense if this is what you're doing for a living. And especially when there's, as far as how to videos, they're already out there. Yeah, yeah. If you need to learn how to do something, there's plenty of them out there. They're already done. So it's like, what more can you or I bring to the table unless you're doing something like building a bandsaw? You know, not a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, yeah. So to me, like it's given some of those videos on my second channel that have done fairly well. So the one where I had to cut through my deadbolt, that had story to it. You just really, you're unlikely to encounter that. And if you do, you're unlikely to necessarily look for a video on that, but it did well. Um, so it's more of a narrative kind of driven thing or the fan placement one. So a big inspiration for some of that is, are you familiar with a channel called Technology Connections? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, he takes the most ordinary things researches them well he doesn't even do any experiments he just talks about them and right. explains things and it those work really well for him so that to move a little bit more in that direction because some of the videos on that have worked very well of course the problem is i'm always inclined to get too much into the science and measure things and stuff like that which you know most people just go bah, 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 bah. <laughs> you just kind of ch check out when the numbers start coming on screen yeah 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 what's the future of your channel look like are you going to keep doing more big projects you're going to design any more tools uh, i haven't got any tools in the plan right now and in terms of the woodworking projects like that's more driven by needs yeah so like i did a couple of beds like i wouldn't have built those for youtube i built those because we needed them so might as well film it um so that's the needs of course you know that that means the video doesn't necessarily have to do that well um, so the woodworking projects, I think at this point are primarily driven by needs. Yeah. An exception to that was the, uh, the cap shooter that I built. Um, that was kind of a, I just want to try that. Mm -hmm. It did. Okay. Not as the, the, that sort of thing, like going back five years, that would have gotten millions of views and you know, now not so much. Uh, it did, it did. Okay. I was hoping for much better. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's more in terms of just exploring other sort of things like the fan placement one. Um, the key, the tricky part is for me is like making it uh, interesting to me and interesting to the viewer, which is a bit at odds because the level at the level at which these things are interesting to me is beyond a lot of the audience, and the things that perhaps are interesting to a lot of the audience to me is like, oh my god, that's dead obvious. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's my channel in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I wish, you know, sometimes I think it's like, should I do sort of like uh, for beginners type of thing? My page about uh, beginning woodworking, because I got that question so many times, it's mm -hmm. doing relatively well. So thinking about, you know, should I make a video version of that? Uh, I just I haven't gotten around to it. That's but that's another thing that I, yeah, I should should do. Well, it's probably getting a lot harder now that you've got kids. <laughs> well, yeah, like the time I have available is less than half of what it used to be. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's frustrating quite often. It's like, you know, it's like it's 4.30 and I'm on a roll. It's like, time's up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, cool. Hey, Matthias, it was great talking to you again. We're going to have to do this again. I'm going to start you know, bringing people back onto this podcast and we can get more in depth in specific things. Thanks for watching, everybody.